Okay, so uh, I think we're going to get started. Uh, so if everyone could take your seats. Uh, I'm very glad to be giving the opening talk on Wednesday, so right after the pool party as we all return back, back to Earth. And uh, we've got a wonderful, uh, I, think, I think a very interesting uh, talk, especially given that some of the other presenters are going to be discussing various medical-related issues. So let's jump in. As you guys can see, the title of my talk is Cronyism, How the AMA, the American Medical Association, Cartelized the Medical Profession. So um, what's this presentation about? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to concentrate on the efforts of the American Medical Association in the progressive era, which I'm broadly defining as the period 1897 to 1929, to restrict the supply of doctors by lobbying in the individual states for stricter licensing requirements. So medical licenses for doctors really began in the 1880s, but it was really during the progressive era that they kind of took on a whole new meaning as they became much more restrictive and exclusionary for reasons that we will get into. And another very interesting way of restricting the supply of doctors is to require tougher accreditation standards for the nation's medical schools. It was really only beginning in the early 1900s that the nation's medical schools, and really for that matter, the nation's universities, uh, started to experience tougher compulsory, compulsory uh, accreditation uh, standards, and a lot of uh, medical schools, for that reason, uh, had, had closed. Right, So you, you're able to, one, restrict the supply of entrance by requiring tougher licenses, but then you're also able to restrict the supply of schools, which of course are going to train these entrants by requiring tougher accreditation standards, mandating very expensive uh, labs and uh, long training for graduate students, etc. Right. So what I want to argue is that the AMA's efforts were examples of cronyism. So I define cronyism as when the government passes policies to benefit special interests at the expense of the overall public. Okay, so when we when you have a politician advocates some sort of policy, well, we've got to institute a tariff, we've got to subsidize this industry, we've got to do X, Y, and Z. The stated reason is almost always in the public interest. Right? You're not really going to win re-election if you say, well, we've got to subsidize this industry because the CEO of that company, I'm friends with them, or they donated to my campaign. That's not really going to, you're not really going to win re-election that often. You have to, you have to dress up whatever you're trying to sell in some sort of public interest garb. You've got to speak in a sort of very uh, a highfalutin rhetoric. You, you, you have to say, well, I'm doing it for my, uh, my countrymen, the American people. We've got to protect jobs. We've got to protect workers. We've got to protect the elderly. Something that really captures you know, the emotional gut feeling of your average person. That's how uh, really these special interest policies are, are camouflaged, right? That's how they get, that, that, that's how the relevant legislature, uh, et cetera, actually uh, passes them. Right? There's always some sort of public interest uh, justification when the real reason that the American Medical Association was pushing for this was they wanted to secure higher prices of medical services and they wanted to restrict the choices of consumers. All right? So they wanted to make sure that consumers only purchased certain types of medical ser services, traditional um, medical therapies, as we'll see, it's allopathic medicine, as it used to be described in the past. And they also wanted uh, people to only be able to purchase them from the most established doctors, the most expensive doctors, right? Um, so uh, a, more, uh, a more common way of putting this is we call this a racket, right? It's basically a, a criminal-influenced um, activity. Uh, in, in the modern realm, you could say this could should be prosecuted under RICO, but um, uh, unfortunately, that's not the case, right? Um, <laughs> okay, so this is actually a part. This is a, a, a small story of a of a the book uh, that I've been working on. Um, so this is uh, title. The tentative title is Cronyism: Rise of the Corporatist State from 1849 to 1953. 
So, so for those of you who've read uh, my first volume on cronyism, it's Cronyism, Liberty versus Power in Early America, 1607 to 1849. This is kind of the second book. It can be standalone, doesn't necessarily require the first book. And then hoping I finish, basically go up to the present era in one final, uh, one final volume. So what I'm really trying to do in this book in the American Medical Association's efforts were an example of this. I'm trying to trace the development of what was known as corporatism in America, which is circa 1897 to 1953, very broad period, we could say, of the progressive era and the New Deal era. Right? So we, in, in, in our high school history classes, we learn about how great these periods were, so on and so forth, and how you had all these public interest politicians. They were bringing businesses and other sorts of entrenched interests to heal, and they were all fighting for the common man, the average worker, the average Joe, etc. Right? But what they were really trying to do was they were trying to develop a system known as corporatism. So corporatism... Really, it's related to the word corporation, right? It's a system where the economy is organized into various governmentally privileged cartels that are monitored, enforced, privileged, etc., by various regulatory agencies. Very broadly, we can say this is almost the economic you know, definition of fascism, or at least the original definition. So the idea is that, well, you can't have this confisc uh, this very uh, uh, threatening socialism, right? This uh, that was becoming a bigger and bigger thing, and you can't have the free market. That's too unstable. So you got to have a middle of the road system, right? And the middle of the road system is going to be able to stabilize economic activity, and we're going to organize all of the economy into various groups, right? And then those various groups, they're not going to deal with each other necessarily through the price system, but it's going to be through various regulatory agencies. You've got the railroads, the Interstate Commerce Commission it's kind of happened technically before this period, but it was really the first major regulatory agency, Interstate Commerce Commission. You've got the banks. They have the Federal Reserve System. So if Interstate Commerce Commission came out in 1887, next major regulatory agency was the Federal Reserve System, uh, really cardinalized the nation's banks um, in favor of Wall Street as we might briefly talk about, or of course, the Interstate Commerce Commission cartelized the nation's railroads. And just to clarify what I mean by a cartel is it's uh, basically it's when a group of sellers come together and they coordinate a restriction in supply and a raising an increase in the price. Okay. Right. And so these fail on the free market, but they can survive in various forms when backed by government coercion. Okay. So the railroads were able to cartelize under the Interstate Commerce Commission. The banks were able to cartelize under the Federal Reserve System. You have industry, the Federal Trade Commission. You have financial services uh, with the Ex uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, basically the Ex Securities Act, Securities and Exchange Act. Then you have airlines, the Civil Aeronautics Act, uh, created the Civil Aeronautics Board. All right. Um, so each of these regulatory agencies and these laws what they really did is they grouped together various parts of industry into some sort of cartelist scheme, right? Well, now there's going to be restrictions on what types of prices you can charge, what types of products you can produce. Uh, there's going to be certain entry requirements in getting into the business. And all of this, the real effect was to restrict supply and to raise uh, the price of whatever service we're talking about, okay? So when we... Think about corporatism. Okay, well, this can be advocated in the public interest, but we're doing this to stabilize the economy. The free market is too, is too reckless, leads to all these terrible business cycles, poverty, child labor, environmental pollution, so on and so forth, right? We've all, we've all been told this. Um, but, but who the corporatism really benefits is the special interests, as we'll see. And it's really just a, a new arena for the special interests to fight for various uh, privileges that they want, as opposed to rival special interests, right? Uh, so they're going to lobby the government um, to influence the legislation, the laws that create these various corporatist systems, as well, as well as very crucially, as Murray Rothbard always loved to emphasize, the personnel, okay? The actual commissioners interpreting the laws, interpreting the mandates, deciding which interests are going to benefit, 
Okay, they're going to try to influence them or make sure their guy or their you know their guys are appointed right, instead of rival interests. Right, so the, in the Interstate Commerce Commission, the railroads were always fighting against the shippers. Uh, shippers being not necessarily people who ran the ships, like on their ocean, but the, those people who would pay the railroads for their services, as well as unions. Wall Street and the Federal Reserve System would fight basically Chicago banks as well as rural banks. And Federal Trade Commission, you've got large corporations versus small businesses and unions, and so on and so forth. Okay. And so this is all happening during this time period, and it was basically almost a free-for-all. Sometimes these agencies would fall in the hands of one group, then they would fall in the hands of another group, and different interests would, would benefit. They would capture the privileges. The, of course, the, 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 the group that would always lose was, was the consumer. Okay? They were the major loser in this, uh, in this affair. And what's fascinating, and this is how we get into the medical services, is that the very similar phenomenon actually happened with various professions, trade associations. Okay? During this time period, the American Pharmaceutical Association was basically lobbying for licenses to control pharmacists. Well, if you want to sell certain drugs, uh, you know, certain uh, medicines that consumers will buy, you have to have a license. You can't just be your average Joe trying to uh, sell a product that the consumer wants. You have to have a license. And where are you going to get this license? Well, it's going to be from a state board that is run by the state's pharmacists. Okay, So they have a vested interest in making sure only a very small group of people get those licenses. The American Bar Association, this may come as a surprise for all of you, but lawyers are interested in cronyism for themselves, uh, is that they were instituting requirements for lawyers in arbitration proceedings. For the longest time, arbitration was actually a way of sort of avoiding the nation's courts. And businesses would voluntarily agree, okay, well, we'll abide by these arbitration rulings. Starting in the 1920s, it was really lawyers, they started to lobby state legislatures to say, well, if you want to have some sort of arbitration proceeding, you need a lawyer for this and a lawyer for that. Then you need a stenographer. Then you need all this. And what does that do? That jacks up, of course, uh, the demand for certain, uh, for certain lawyers. Right. Um, this may also come as a shock for you, but uh, the nation's teachers are also interested in cronyism for themselves. Uh, the National Education Association during this time period was lobbying the states for professional training requirements for teaching K-12. through Well, if you want to teach kindergarten, you've got to take a graduate course on some abstract theory. If you want to teach sixth grade math, you have to take real analysis or Calc 5 or something like that, even though uh, you're never going to have to use that when you're teaching, um, uh, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're teaching uh, kindergartners or sixth graders, etc., and of course, the American Medical Association, all right, which is really the main group that we're going to be talking about today. Okay. So the American Medical Association is one of the standard examples of a interest group that's lobbying for cronies and for themselves um, under the guise of promoting the public interest. All right. So it's especially uh, a strong argument um, uh, the, the promoting the public interest whenever you're dealing with anything health-related, as I'm sure we all know, given the events of the past couple of years. Say, so, well, we need to have our doctors be well-trained because you don't want people getting poisoned, or we need to have the, the, the Food and Drug Administration regulate the nation's food and drug supply because we don't want people getting poisoned. We want to make sure they have the best quality um, uh, products, et cetera. Uh, you know, same thing with lockdowns and uh, mask mandates and so on. It's it's the it's it, it's the 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 health interest is always a very very um, or excuse me the public interest argument is always very very potent when it comes to anything health related because it's something that the public sort of has a knee jerk reaction to. Yeah, I don't want to be drinking poisoned water or something like that. Well, of course we have to have the government take care of that. It just seems so simple. Okay, so let's jump in. So when we're talking about medical competition in the late 19th century, uh, there were really various groups of scientific therapies, so to speak, what consumers could use if they have a certain ailment, if they're experiencing some sort of pain. And in many ways, some of these groups are still around, as we'll see. Um, some of them have reduced influence, but that's largely because of, of, of government laws. 
Uh, so the AMA doctors, doctors in this trade organization, practiced what alternative therapies called allopathic care. You don't really hear of um, this term anymore, but it was used back then. And it basically refers to you use pain killing uh, drugs to, uh, you know, if, 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 to, to cure some some problem. All right. Now, <laughs> what's important about these pain killing drugs back then is they were not the same pain killing drugs we have now. OK, <laughs> so these drugs were usually mixtures of cocaine, <laughs> opium, whiskey, other alcohols, morphine. Uh, just to give you some perspective, aspirin was only discovered in 1899, okay? So back then, if you wanted, if, if let's say you have a, a child and they're sick, um, you would call the doctor. You wouldn't go to a, a Medi-Merge or something like that. And the doctor would, would come over, and they would come with their little, their, their little uh, you know, doctor's case, and they'd go up to the room where, where, where little Susie is, and maybe all of the other kids are standing by her, or she's in the bed, and the doctor would, of course, come out, and he'd take out those big lollipops, right? And he'd give them to each of the kids, you know, who are still there, and he'd, he'd take a look at Susie, and he'd say, oh, let's say she has strep throat, and she'd say, you know, he'd say, open your mouth, and she'd open her mouth, and he says, all right, he goes, Okay, I'm going to give you a little cocaine for that, right? Uh, and Susie would go, okay, all right, right? But that's, that's, <laughs> that was the state of medicine at the time. And you could either go to a doctor for these services or you could buy a patent medicine over the counter. And people would always criticize these patent medicines for saying, well, it's got cocaine or it's just alcohol. But that's what the doctors were prescribing, right? That's what the doctors were giving you. So it was really, it was very imperfect uh, choices, but you could go with a more expensive doctor or you could go with some sort of patent medicine uh, that could be cheaper. And really what they were just trying to do was sort of numb the pain. Okay, and this was not too far off from the era where if you got shot in the arm, it was in the Civil War, they gave you some whiskey, they gave you a block of wood, <laughs> they said, chug the whiskey, put your teeth on the block of wood, and then we're going to saw off your arm, right? So it's, yeah, uh, it's not fun. It's, it's pretty, pretty rough. <laughs> Pretty rough way to go. Um, so there were alternative therapies. You had the homeopathic doctors practicing what's known as homeopathy. And this is, I'm not a medical expert, but this, 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 this basic, this therapy is sort of like cures like, which is that you, you lose, you use, excuse me, some sort of diluted symptoms of the sickness to strengthen the immune system. So if someone is sick with something, you try to give them some sort of remedy that will it, it sort of uh, introduce your body to, or, or sort of help your body you know, fight it, the the infection on its own. Okay, this is generally the the therapy of of, of homeopathy. This was a competing um, alternative. Okay, you could take some some remedies that could sometimes help uh, instead of taking, say, a pain killing drug, which was really more of trying to mask the symptoms, right? You're experiencing pain, so you're taking some alcohol. The alcohol really isn't making you feel better. I mean, it's not really curing you, but it is kind of numbing the pain, so to speak, right? And then there were the eclectic uh, doctors, the eclectics, and they were giving various herbal remedies, right? So you've got some sort of plant-based solution or plant-based medicine and, and all of that, and, and that's still around. Both of these are, are still around in various forms. And the important thing is this. It's that you know, different consumers subjectively decided which treatment worked for them, much like today. Okay, so some consumers, they would use a traditional doctor, painkilling drugs. Other consumers would use uh, um, uh, the, the, the homeopathy. Uh, they'd go to a homeopath. Um, uh, you'd have the eclectics. They would have various herbal remedies, uh, et cetera. Right, and they would decide. They would patronize the consumer. They would patronize the doctors that would basically um, they felt that would give them the most um, relief from the pain, or that would help them with their various um, uh, ailment. Okay, so the AMA did not really like this. The AMA was created a little bit before the Civil War, and it was gaining strength over the uh, in, in the ensuing decades. And the AMA was mainly the traditional doctors. And by the 1880s, the AMA was lobbying for state licensing boards to restrict the supply of doctors. Basically saying, well, we want all doctors in the state of Alabama to pass an exam uh, or, and or earn a diploma from a medical school. 
right? So you have to pass some sort of exam. Uh, you have to earn, um, you might also have to earn a diploma from a medical school, and then you can charge for medical services, right? That's the key. In order for you to make money, right, I can offer you medical advice, uh, but if I charge it, then I have to have a license, right? Or I'm engaging in something nefarious and illegal, okay? So they would lobby for these various state licensing boards. But the problem was this. It's that the alternative therapies were also very influential, and consumers patronized them a lot. So the AMA kind of had to compromise in each of the states. They were only able to get single board systems, right? So you have one board. Uh, in the state of New Jersey, in the state of Alabama, in the state of Florida, and it would have representation from all of these groups to kind of give them all a fair hearing, right? Maybe one third representation each. Uh, or you would have systems of separate boards. You'd have a system for the homeopaths in New Jersey, then you'd have a system for the traditional doctors in New Jersey, you know, these various licensing boards. And so they were able to kind of get this restriction, but they weren't really restricting that much. That's what the AMA was, was upset about. And this uh, was still allowed for intense competition among the nation's doctors, right? And just to give you some numbers, if we look at the number of physicians per 100,000 in population, all right, this, uh, they increased from 171 in 1880 to 173 in 1900. So actually, after despite these licensing laws, the number of physicians uh, in the, relative to the rest of the population was actually slightly growing. Right? The AMA wanted it to go down, but it was actually going up. Okay, that's, that's bad for business, so to speak. Okay, A big reason for this was that these degree-granting medical schools, which at the time were largely unregulated, by the states, you could basically set up your own medical school and accreditation. You could have your own private accreditation, et cetera, or whatever accreditation standards were required or were relatively lenient. Uh, they increased from 100 in 1880 to 160 in 1901. Right? So they're pumping out more competitors, basically. That's the way to put it. Right? You're pumping out more doctors, uh, different types of doctors. So you've got uh, your traditional uh, doctors, you've got the higher quality doctors graduating from the nation's elite schools, Johns Hopkins, Harvard, uh, et cetera. Then you've got lower ranked schools with these traditional doctors. Then you also have schools for the uh, heterodox therapies. Okay. And this was, this is a problem uh, according to the AMA. Uh, and also make it worse is that there were new medicines that were coming out. Uh, osteopaths and chiropractors uh, were basically a new type of therapy that were developing at the turn of the century. In the long story short, most people have heard of chiropractors, osteopaths probably not so much, was that they would use some sort of spinal adjustment uh, or adjustment of the bones to basically alleviate pain. So rather than, oh, your back's hurting, let me give you some morphine. Oh, your back's hurting, let me crack your back, All right? Something like that. And then you had the optometrists. Uh, the eye doctors, and th these were really big uh, competitors for your traditional doctors because they usually monopolized, they, they thought they would also have all the eye care services of their patients, but instead some people were going to doctors who just specialized in eye care, right? And this was, this was the AMA really criticized this. They're like, hey, you can't, you're having doctors specialize in eye care. We can't, we, we can't have that. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, and actually, yeah, you look at some quotes and they call it quackery and all sorts of stuff, all right? Okay. All right, so what does the AMA do? The doctors, they could decide to be more efficient, try to innovate, lower prices to try to capture a greater uh, supply of the market, improve product quality. Do they do that? Of course not. They lobby for more restrictions, right? Because that's, that's the American way. Uh, so circa 1900, the AMA basically creates a new lobbying front. This is the Council on Medical Education. This was composed of various professors for some of the nation's elite schools. And as we know, they all know best. So this is a good you know, lobbying front. They can do research. Then the AMA and the various states can use this to advocate for various types of, um, of uh, regulations. Okay. Um, so what the AMA wants, they, they go to the drawing board and the, the Council of Medical Education basically devises this sort of blueprint. They say, well, uh, we want to have single board systems with only AMA approved doctors. Basically, we want to get rid of these alternative therapies. So we just want one board for New Jersey, one board for Alabama, and it's all got the traditional doctors. Uh, we want more rigorous medical schools that, that require tougher entrance exams, 
longer academic years, more uh, training required, um, usually uh, lab work required, higher tuition fees, et cetera. Right? So to make the schools more rigorous, to basically cut down on the amount of people who are getting into schools as well as graduating from the schools. And then we want to have tougher licensing exams when you go before these state boards. Now you got to pass nine tests and uh, you know, all sorts of things, et cetera. And the idea is to, again, make it harder for people to qualify uh, to be able to sell their services for, um, uh, 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 for, for money, right? And, and they wanted to force consumers to only purchase higher quality and higher price doctor services, right? That, that, was, that was their goal, okay? They looked da- poorly uh, upon, um, they looked down upon the lower quality doctors. They said, no, consumers can't have this. We want them to only be able to purchase our services. Uh, and well, this is a very, very elitist attitude, basically. Okay, this was, this was, the, this was the AMA, and they, they did not... Um, they, they did not withhold their judgment, basically, in, in, in both uh, public and private to basically look down upon other types of um, therapies, uh, lower quality doctors, etc. cetera, right? Uh, the AMA especially looked down upon uh, black, female, and Catholic immigrant doctors, right? So these were doctors that maybe had less experience going to more disadvantaged uh, schools, et cetera, and they were serving their various communities, uh, various immigrant communities, uh, female doctors, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, female patients, uh, 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 African-American communities, et cetera. And the AMA didn't want that. They're like, no, these groups cannot become uh, doctors. We don't want this type of competition and so on. Right. Uh, we don't want their competition. We also don't want the competition of regular or lower quality uh, white male doctors, et cetera. We need to we need to stop all of this intense competition. Right. So uh, AMA president, Doc, uh, Dr. Frank Billings, uh, he sneered at those colleges that enabled, quote, the clerk, the streetcar conductor, the janitor and others employed during the day to earn a degree. Right. You, People are taking college classes at night. You can't have that, right? You see, people who are employed during the day, right? Well, they're trying to earn a degree at night. Or someone who's trying to improve their lot in society, maybe they're a janitor or a clerk or a streetcar conductor or sort of a a lower, you know, lower skilled profession. Well, they're trying to get a degree. Well, we can't have that. That's, you know, that's not, that that's not good. And this is a great quote from a doctor at a medical school in Tennessee who's basically protesting against the AMA's recommendations. It's a big, uh, it's a block quote. He says, true, our entrance requirements are not the same as those of the University of Pennsylvania or Harvard, nor do we pretend to turn out the same sort of finished product. Yet we do prepare worthy, ambitious men who have striven hard with small opportunities and risen above their surroundings to become family doctors to the farmers of the South and the smaller towns of the mining districts out in the West. Right? All the elite schools were in New England, as they still often are. And he says, can the wealthy who are in a minority say to the poor majority, you shall not have a doctor? And the AMA basically was like, yes. Right? <laughs> uh, that's, <laughs> that's what they're going for. Right? Or they say, well, if you want a doctor, you got you to gotta pay. Right? But the AMA was very successful in a lot of its uh, lobbying. And from about 1900 to 1907, 30 states and territories replaced multiple boards with single boards. They were dominated by the allopaths, or is what the, what the heterodox doctors would call them. And they require, these boards require doctors to graduate from AMA-approved schools. Right? Well, if you want to have a degree, you, gotta, you can't graduate from this college anymore. You've got you, you to graduate from colleges that have standards X, Y, and Z. And yeah, they were producing higher quality doctors along certain dimensions, as we'll see. But again, higher quality comes at a higher price. Someone's sick, you don't always need to go to a doc, uh, a formal, you know, expensive doctor. You can go to an urgent care or Medi-Merge, or you could talk to a nurse or someone else, etc. You want services quick and you want it cheap, okay? And so the number of physicians per 100,000 decreased by about 5%. And the medical colleges decreased by about 20%. It's a big decline. OK, 
Okay, because now these medical schools have to adhere to certain standards as we'll as we'll get to. And this is starting to restrict the supply uh, of medical schools in the nation. All right. And the supply of doctors, of course, is starting to go down again. Medical school takes a long time. So this, this doesn't happen immediately. It's it's really sort of they're playing the long game here. All right. Now, the AMA, however, wants stronger restrictions. And in 1906, the council visited every remaining medical school in the nation, and it issued a report, or it, it basically it, it produced its own report that said only half were satisfactory. Right? So half of the other half just, you know, they got to change or, you know, they got to go. Right? And again, a lot of these colleges were uh, uh, producing doctors in poorer areas, disadvantaged, commu disadvantaged communities, et cetera. Um, However, the American Medical Association was smart, and they realized this was a controversial report. It would look like too self-serving, right? It's like, oh yeah, they can only graduate from these doc uh, these schools where we graduated from, right? You know, it's not it's not a good it's not a good sell. Again, you need a public interest pitch. You need a public interest garb, sort of something that goes over it. And so, well, wouldn't it be great if we had another agency, some sort of other independent? Uh, public spirited institution, maybe some sort of nonprofit foundation to actually issue a very similar report. And that way, instead of having a bunch of doctors <laughs> issue a report saying we need to restrict the supply of doctors, if we have an institute for the advancement of teaching uh, issue uh, this report, well, then it's, well, it's clearly disinterested. It clearly comes from uh, people who don't have a vested interest in this. And so the council went to the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. And so the Carnegie Foundation, as well as the Rockefeller Foundation, et cetera, these were these institutes that were set up in uh, beginning in the Progressive Era, especially during World War I and World War II when tax rates were really high, and they were ways of shielding money. Okay, so just to give you some of the numbers, in about 1913, John D. Rockefeller put $100 million into the Rockefeller uh, Foundation. Coincidentally, it's the same year the income tax came out, right? Um, and this is really, this is like a huge sort of slush fund that was, as we'll see, worked with various special interests or work with various special interests, work with state governments, et cetera, right? They're basically able to just use a massive amount of money, right? The Carnegie Foundation agrees and it chooses a Abraham Flexner to conduct a study. Who was Abraham Flexner? Well, he wasn't knowledgeable about medicine at all. He was, he was a teacher, uh, but he was the brother of Dr. Simon Flexner, who was an advisor to John D. Rockefeller Jr., as well as the director of the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. I believe he was also a formerly professor at the University of Pennsylvania, UPenn, right? One of these very elite uh, schools in the nation. And Simon Flexner was a protege of Dr. William Welch. So you might not know this name, probably you don't, but if, he's got a Wikipedia page, so you know he's, he's cemented his legacy. Um, he was a very famous doctor at the time. He was an advisor to John D. Rockefeller Jr., and he was also a dean of the Johns Hopkins Medical School, so one of the nation's most uh, prestigious institutions, really one of the nation's first graduate uh, degree-granting institutions. Most PhDs, economists, as well as doctors, they all got their degrees in Germany, right? And they all imbibe these ideas of socialism and interventionism. And they say, well, in Germany, they cartelize everything. They privilege certain educators. Well, this would be great. Why don't we do this in America, right? And a lot of our nation's laws and our regulations were heavily influenced by Germany. It's just that we sort of conveniently forgot that after World War I, right? And that was sort of, oh, well, now they're the enemy. Well, we have to go against them. Okay. All right. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. And so Rockefeller, the Flexners, and Welch, they were very pro-elite schools. They were very pro-research-led science. They said re science has to proceed through the laboratory, right? Um, they said every medical school needed to be patterned on uh, John, Johns Hopkins, right? Everyone needs to have this big professional lab facility. The only way we can advance, the sci uh, advance science is through the lab. This contrasted with the patient-led science of Dr. William Osler. It's a very famous um, doctor at the time who basically said, well, lab works good, but it's also just often very abstract theory. Well, why don't we actually learn by treating people? Right, well, that, there you go. 
Uh, so instead, we'll go visit patients at the bedside or the hospital, and we will learn from them, okay, well, if we give them this, are they feeling better, et cetera, or what can we do? And this is less of the research, and it's more of, okay, well, now we actually need to figure out what's, you know, why people are getting sick or something like that, right? And Abraham Flexner, as well as uh, the, whole, the whole group, uh, they praised the government-subsidized educational system in Germany. Right? This is really, they said, well, we need to replicate this. And they said, well, uh, Abraham Flexner said the system in Germany is on an aristocratic plane. It's, it's for the elites, right? It's at that level. America, it's too, the, the, uh, the, medical, uh, uh, the medical schools are, are too democratic, is what he said. Sort of a sneer against, well, it's too competitive, Right, your average Joe could become a doctor. We don't, we don't want that, okay? And uh, as I mentioned, this is where many uh, AMA doctors had earned uh, their graduate degrees. And uh, this is a quote from Abraham Flexner, which is a really interesting quote. He said, the poor boy, he opined, said, had no right to enter medicine, quote, unless it is best for society that he should. Right, it's a way of saying poor people can't become doctors, Right. Uh, saying, well, we, it's best for society. Now, of course, you dress up in the public interest garb, but what it really means is it's best for the existing supply of doctors. We don't want poor people becoming doctors if they're going to lower the prices of everyone else's services, right? Uh, we don't want these lower quality, lower price doctors. Everyone's just got to be these elite doctors graduating from Johns Hopkins or other places, so on and so forth, these, these, these elite schools. Okay, that's, that's how you really... Um, uh, will 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 advance the nation's uh, well-being, right? And their in their health. Okay. So Flexner, Abraham Flexner, he basically duplicates the the AMA report. He duplicates their study in eight, 1909 and 1910. He visits every medical school, and these are often very brief visits. Uh, like so, for example, within three months, he expected 69 schools in 22 states. Like some visits were a couple hours. Again, this is imagine going in three months to 69 schools in 22 states now. Right? This guy didn't have, you know, uh, he wasn't racking up airlines points or something like that, right? I mean, so he was, he was sort of traveling around, and you go a couple, a couple hours, and you go look at a room, and you'd be like, oh, okay, all right, you know, like, eh, yeah, and then he would have his own report. And see, unfortunately, these some of these schools naively accepted him because they're thinking, oh, maybe we could get some money from some of these endowments, the Carnegie Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, but, you know, instead he was sort of, <laughs> he was just ready to criticize all of them. And what's sort of most astonishing is when you actually look at the minutes or the private correspondence between the Council on Medi Medical Education, the Carnegie Foundation, they were extremely concerned about keeping this secret, right? The connection. So, the Carnegie Foundation, the president, uh, actually spoke at a council uh, medical education meeting, and he said, quote, the foundation would be guided very largely by the council's investigations, end quote, but would not mention the council so it would, quote, have the weight of an independent report of a disinterested body. So basically, we're going to follow what you're going to do, but we're not going to cite you, so that way it looks like we're coming up with these conclusions on ourselves, right? Good strategy. Um, quote, we have been hand in glove with you and your committee. When our report comes out, it will be ammunition in your hands. But, quote, maintain in the meantime a position which does not intimate an immediate connection between our two efforts. <laughs> ammunition in your hands. Ammunition for what? Ammunition for restricting the supply of doctors. It was a racket. It was a whole secret, you know, they're keeping this whole thing under wraps. They didn't want to say, well, we're just duplicating this report by the Council on Medical Education. This is this independent guy who knows, doesn't really know much about medicine, who's going to all the schools and is now just issuing an edict on all of them. Right? It's <laughs> an interesting strategy. Um, and so this was promoted as a disinterested muckraking piece, this Flexner Report of 1910. This famous Flexner Report, it was like Upton Sinclair's The Jungle or... Uh, other stuff, well, we've got to clean up the supply of the nation's doctors, right? And Flexner said only 31 of the nation's 131 medical schools should remain open. It's basically close 100 medical schools. That would leave no schools in 22 states, okay? Uh, that's, that's a pretty big, uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty big competitive disadvantage for, for those regions, 
He's basically saying, well, these medical schools, they shouldn't be allowed to uh, graduate doctors because then they're going to now compete with these other uh, existing supply of doctors. And this was a very successful cover-up. The AMA connection uh, was quite hidden. And people said, well, we've, the state legislature said, well, we've got to do something. All of these uh, schools, they're producing all of these uh, low-quality doctors. We've got to clean up, uh, clean, clean up uh, these, various, um, uh, these various programs or institute higher requirements, not recognizing that, of course, this would require a lot of schools to fail. The results, results were striking. By the mid-1910s, so right around World War uh, I, there were, about, there were only there were single boards in about 43 states, and they were dominated by the allopaths. So the alternative therapies were quite uh, restricted, blocked out. They had much reduced uh, representation, um, if at all. Chiropractors were kind of put in their own discriminated systems. Oh, well, they're not real doctors, but we'll give them this little part. The optometrists were ended up, they were brought in the cartel, right? Um, they, they at least kind of benefited all right. But even then, it was, again, it was still, you've got these much more restrictive uh, licensing systems. And the AMA becomes a de facto accreditation agency. Basically, they're the group that more or less approves what colleges are going to exist. And medical schools precipitously decline, not as much as what Flexner wants, but again, you can't always get what you want. Uh, from about 131 to 1910 to 76 in 1929. So as the population was increasing, the supply of uh, degree-granting institutions was decreasing. That was the whole, that was the whole point. That was, the, that was the strategy, basically. That, that, that's what they were trying to do, right? And uh, who were the main beneficiaries of this, of course? Well, it was the nation's elite institutions, right? It was the nation's uh, prestigious institutions because not only did they benefit, but they got money from the Rockefeller Foundation and various state governments, right? So it was these top state universities or these private schools, et cetera. So in 1920, Rockefeller Jr. gives Abraham Flexner $50 million. It was through one of his nonprofits, the General Education Board, uh, to basically gift Johns Hopkins, the University of Chicago, and other schools. And then various states matched Rockefeller donations to state universities. $50 million is a lot of money now. It's a lot more money back then. Okay, this is like only like a couple years after the Federal Reserve, right? So the inflation was, was not that out of control. And this new money often leads to these various research-heavy professorships. Oh, well, now the professors can specialize in research in the lab. Well, we don't have to teach these students anymore. Uh, it's like, well, we've got all this money. Uh, we can just concentrate on this. And it was often at the public's expense because, one, a lot of academics back in the day would offer medical services as sort of a part-time gig, right? Well, we don't make a whole lot of money through the university, so at night or on the days I'm not teaching, I'll go, um, go to the hospital or I'm going to uh, go visit people at their houses, et cetera, and make money that way. So the public lost out. And then the graduate students were deprived of hands-on technical experience because now they were focused more on passing these rigorous exams and learning how to do lab research, even though they might not actually be performing lab research in whatever occupation they have in life, right? Being a, if they're, they're helping poor people or they're, 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 um, they're providing services to little Susie, they might not need to know all of this in-depth stuff. I mean, it's just like with, with the math teachers, right? You want to teach sixth grade algebra. Do you really have to know differential equations or real analysis? But, you know, again, you're trying to restrict the supply, okay? There's a great quote from William Osler, and he said, this incentivized, quote, clinical prigs, whose only human interest was research, right? And this is saying, well, this isn't what the nation's medical doctors, uh, this isn't what the nation needs, okay? This is, this is the wrong type of, of training, so to speak. And so um, as, I, as I wrap up, um, I just wanted to go through some, some sort of striking statistics and how this led to a, a veritable doctor shortage in the nation, okay? So the number of physicians per 100,000 in population decreased from 164 in 1910 to 125 in 1929. So 24% decrease, and then since 1910, it was a 28% decrease. It's a, huge, it's a big decrease, <laughs> Uh, this hit rural communities disproportionately because now these areas were deprived of doctors. 
to go through some numbers from 1906 to 1923, the number of people per doctors in large cities increased 9%. In smaller towns, it increased 54%. So very often, if you go to a small town, there's maybe one or two doctors. They can charge an arm and a leg. Um, it's a bad pun. But uh, they're the only ones, right? And so these small communities, are kind of, you're, you're kind of disadvantaged, right? These are the doctors that you could patronize, right? And very often the hit was for uh, minority doctors, immigrant doctors, female doctors, et cetera. They were often excluded. Uh, Jewish doctors as well from the nation's schools as well as licensing boards, et cetera. So all these groups are serving uh, other communities. Well, we need, to, we, 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 need to, we need to stop that. Now, the Council on Medical Education, uh, looking at this data, they had sort of smiled and they said, well, quote, we had anticipated this decline and felt that it was a desirable thing because we had an oversupply of poor, mediocre practitioners. There we go. Now, a little bit more to the point was that the real reason the average doctor's salary increased from $1,000 in 1900 to over $6,000 in 1929. Exploded over 500%. Uh, average increases in prices was about over, a little bit over 100%, 110%. So the doctors are really raking in the cash, right? That was the whole, that was the whole point. You restrict the supply of doctors, and then you can jack up the price. And this is why, this is when you start to see a lot of uh, push for having some sort of socialized medicine. Why? Because no one could afford doctors anymore, okay? And the AMA has, ever since this, been always to uh, have a very restrictive attitude um, and be able to control the supply of doctors. Right? It's, it's, it's examples of cronyism. Okay, it's, this is, uh, but you're able to sell it because of the public interest argument. Even though um, restricting the supply of doctors didn't improve really the quality um, or compensate for the restricted choice of consumers in the higher prices they had to pay. Um, so I know uh, this is kind of going through a little bit quickly at the end. Um, I can share these PowerPoint slides with whoever who's interested. Uh, just to conclude... During the so-called progressive era, the AMA lobbied for cartelizing restrictions that reduced competition and raised the prices of their services. And the AMA behaved like other special interest groups during this time, and they were very successful because of the public interest arguments they made. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you so much for your time.